author, storyteller, tour guide, and professor, Bill Goodstein is a Denver native who has churned out more than 20 volumes about the Mile High City. His most recent book, The Denver That Is No More, the story of the city's demolished landmarks is now available. And today, Bill will take us on a captivating adventure. Oh, this is an old uh, bio, but he'll take us on a captivating uh, tour and story of the Olympics that are no more. So sit back and enjoy Thought Bill's lively storytelling. Thank you and welcome, Bill. Well, it is a beautiful day out a day that anybody could go and appreciate except the misanthropes. And the misanthropes are those that believe that the way you have fun is you go atop an icy, cold, slippery mountain peak and you risk your life by maybe only a broken leg or arm or two by sliding down the hill in the name of skiing. And this was very much in contrast with the way Colorado treated the mountains in the 19th century. And at that time, the miners that are scouring for wealth wherever they can make it knew enough that try to dig out gold in the middle of Colorado winters out of that, where often the mountains emptied come September, October, and mining didn't again start until the spring. Only very desperate individuals sometimes were in the mountains during the winter out of this, and those included those that were engaged in Norwegian snowshoeing. Norwegian snowshoeing was how skiing was originally introduced into Colorado. Basically, there were Scandinavian miners in the area that knew about skiing. And when all the roads were closed, there was no other way of getting around. They skied from one location to another. And of course, the Jews were among the pioneer skiers of Colorado. In particular, Otto Beers was sort of the personification of the desperate need for skiing at this time. Otto Beers was quite an adventurer he is the son of a Latvian English family. He's not wanted in Latvia. He's not wanted in England. He's sent to New York. He's not wanted there. He's sent to San Francisco. He's not wanted there. Eventually, he's in the United States Army during the Civil War in New Mexico, from which he comes to Colorado. And soon he is hustling, taking whatever job he can, including delivering the mail in southwestern Colorado. And the mail must go through, and Otto Mears learns, among other things, how to ski, to go and get the mail coming through. This is but a prelude to his career, where he is later a foremost toll road builder, railroad builder, political figure at large out of it itself, but that tended to be the attitude to Colorado in the 19th century that Norwegian snowshoeing was only a desperate activity. Nobody thought that somehow standing atop an icy cold mountain with vicious winds sweeping by, the threats of avalanches coming was supposedly fun. And the people that in some ways are responsible for this transformation <coughs> were those that were in the Colorado of Europe. In the course of the 19th century, Colorado is projecting itself as the Switzerland of America. And at this time, Switzerland is emphasizing its mountains as the ideal summer get away, especially for the affluent elsewhere on the continent. Various resort cities emerge, and that's where you would go in the middle of the summer to escape the heat, the pollution, diseases, COVID, everything else along the way. 
Well, anyway, before by the 1890s, there's something of a crisis in the Swiss tourist industry. And the problem is they have built all these resorts, all these lodges that are occupied only three months a year or so out of it. And that does not seem to be a very efficient investment. So they decide, let's winterize these lodges. But the question is, who wants to go to a high mountaintop in the middle of the winter, and they figure that the most foolish people around will do that, i.e. the wealthy, members of royalty, the aristocracy <coughs> of that they are. Well, anyway, the upshot of all this lands up being the Swiss tourist industry start this very conscious, very deliberate effort to try to convince people that skiing is fun. And skiing is designed as a yeah, luxury for the ultra wealthy that can go and rent the lodging, rent this fancy equipment, soon hire personalized trainers, of that itself. And meanwhile, the publicity industry is well in charge of all of this, promoting that skiing is fun, that it's not just for the aristocracy. You, the members of the upper middle class, you can come to Switzerland too and risk breaking your neck sliding down hills along the way of this. And so you have that steady st you had drumbeat going on and Colorado starts hearing it. And by the early 20th century, there are efforts at skiing as a sport in the area. At quite an early date, they build a ski jump over at the Berkeley Lake Resort in far Northwest Denver. Steamboat Springs starts winter games about the same time out of it, including ski jumping, other competitions. Then in December 1913 in Denver, it starts snowing and snowing and snowing and snowing. And eventually about 50 inches of snow packed the ground after the city's all time worst winter blizzard. The city is completely paralyzed of it except for a few Norwegian snowshoers that are getting around as cross country skiers at this time. And this leads others to say, hey, maybe there's something into this. Maybe this can be fun instead of desperate that efforts at transportation when there's no other way to get around on that. But for the most part, skiing tends to be stagnant in the United States until the 1930s. This is the time of the Great Depression. Railroads are badly hurting in consequence of the depression. And at this period, railroads are heavily regulated by the Interstate Commerce Commission. And it tells railroads, if you have gotten the schedule to run three trains a day from New York to Northern Vermont, you are going to run three trains a day, even if you have no passengers on that. And the way that New England railroads try to uh, get some passengers is they get a hold of these isolated mountain slopes in Vermont, New Hampshire, and they start going and catering to the wealthy. You can escape Boston, you can escape New York and have your getaway by coming up to Mount Stowe or some other resort in Northern New England at the time. Among the people that sees how successful all of this is, is Avril Harriman. At one time, everybody knew who Avril Harriman is. Governor of New York, ambassador at large for the United States, possible Democratic Party candidate for president, in charge of negotiations to end the Vietnam War. Well, Avril Harriman starts out as his father's son. He was the son of Edward Harriman, who was this railroad monopolist par excellence of the early 20th century, 
who eventually controls most Western railroads. Well, part of the problem is that in the course of the late 19th, early 20th century, the Union Pacific, in particular, sort of the crown gem of the Harriman Empire, drastically overbuilds. And by the 1930s, with the Depression, it has a lot of routes, it has to run trains on, and no passengers, no revenue. Meanwhile, various government entities says, oh, the Union Pacific has all this land in utterly isolated blocks of this. Let's tax the Union Pacific because it's the only company out there that has any money to go and pay its taxes. So what Avril Harriman does is he has the Union Pacific develop a place called Sun Valley in Idaho of this. And of course, the name Sun Valley is a bit misleading. The Sun Valley is typical northern Idaho, cold, icy, snowy, forlorn. And again, it's only the rich, it's only the wealthy, it's only the super trendy that are going to come up there. And April Harriman is seeing that this is the case. He has strong ties with Hollywood, strong public relations connections, and he is seeing that leading Hollywood stars go up the Sun Valley of this, complete with movie crews of this, and suddenly you will have a film about high-class romance, or even low-class romance, or a gangster film, or a cowboy film, it doesn't matter. Suddenly there is a ski scene in it celebrating the glory and the glamour and the sophistication of Sun Valley. And seeing the success of Sun Valley and how skiing is sort of the ultra cheek opportunity that is around on this, Colorado naturally goes and starts marching in step with all of this. And among the people that are going and embracing skiing in the 1930s are members of the Arlberg Club. The Arlberg Club is among the most powerful, most secretive forces in Colorado. It is established about 1930 by the extremely wealthy as something of a mountain club for, so what the Denver Country Club is for the golf crowd, the Arlberg Club was sort of to be for the skiers, the hikers up in the mountains. And with the building of the Moffat Railroad, especially the Moffat Tunnel, the Arlberg Club lands up getting a great deal of the land on the western portal of the Moffat Tunnel as sort of its idyllic resort, club house, hiking, camping, socializing crowd there. A leader of the Arlberg Club was George Cramner. George Cramner starts out as the son of a wealthy cowboy who becomes a developer. Eventually, he is a leading securities dealer, oil investor, who about the, the summer of 1929 sees that something is wrong with the stock market. He sells out all of his holdings just before the Wall Street collapse and retires with a, an extremely comfortable fortune and he decides he's going to go and devote himself into politics. The man with whom he lands up working in politics is Denver Mayor Ben Stapleton. In particular, in 1931, Stapleton, an old Klansman who actually was elected mayor in 1930, 1923 with Philip Hornbein, a Jewish attorney as his campaign manager, Stapleton is defeated for re-election in 1931. The man that oversees the return of Stapleton to office in 1935 is George Cramner. Cramner is rewarded by going and being named manager of improvements and parks, a position that makes him de facto deputy mayor. And for the next 12 years, as much as Ben Stapleton 
George Cramner is going and running Denver. He's putting his personal dreams in as public policy. For example, he sees the development of a place called Cramner Park, which is over between First and Third Avenues, just to the east of Birch Street, and directly east of the park was George Cramner's house at 200 Cherry Street. Sheer coincidence, of course, on that. George Cramner sees there's this lovely amphitheater, natural spot up in the Garden of the Red Rocks. He sees the, the federal crews come in and blast out a lot of the natural uh, stonework there to build an amphitheater of that. Well, as a leader of the Arbor Club, as well as the city's manager of improvements in parks, George Cramner also decides that what the city of Denver needs as part of its mountain park system is an idyllic ski resort directly adjacent to the headquarters of the Arbor Club that becomes Winter Park. And given the class character of who skied in 1939, 1940, that was sort of the natural spot for going and being the personal ski resort of the Arlberg Club of this. And the Arlberg Club is still around on that. Over the years, it sometimes had clashes with the Moffat Railroad Commission, when one of those became too extreme, the state legislature responded by abolishing the Moffat Railroad Tunnel Commission out of that. About 2001 or so, the Arlberg Club is locked into a dispute with Denver City Auditor Don Maris. And among the leaders of the Arlberg Club at this time was Dean Singleton, the owner publisher of the Denver Post. And Dean Singleton decides he needs to find a candidate for mayor that is going to quash all of this nonsense about the city asserting public rights over Winter Park rather than the Arlberg Club going and running things. And the man that Dean Singleton makes connections with is John Hickenlooper. And as much as anything, it's sort of to provoke the Arlberg Club is partly how Hickenlooper first is elected mayor of Denver. But that is considerably in the future. Meanwhile, world politics are also impacting Colorado skiing. About the time that Winter Park is being dedicated, World War II breaks out. Among the earliest battles of World War II is the Russo-Finnish War of 1939-1940. And at first glance, it would seem that the Soviet empire would have no problems going and crushing Finland. Finland was well prepared with a lot of winter soldiers. Men that had been trained to fight on skis, to fight in cold, bitter weather out of this, that knew how to wear their uh, camouflage out of that, as opposed to which Stalin, the Soviet dictator, decides why not go and mobilize troops from Central Asia that have never seen snow, much less know how to deal with the cold, and have them attack the Finns. And for about six months, the Finns are able to hold their own against the Soviets out of that there. And this teaches military establishments around the world a lesson that they have to have soldiers that are ready to fight in any and every circumstance and climate. Among the people that are embracing this idea are members of a nation, United States Ski Federation. There's uh, various ski clubs in Colorado by this time. And they are going and lobbying the War Department that as the US is building up for World War II, what it needs to do is to go and to have a special regiment, maybe even a division of men that are specially trained to fight in all terrains, especially to fight in 
on skis in the worst of winter weather. And of course, the place, to Colorado's credit, you always get the worst of winter weather can be the Colorado Rockies. And on this basis, the War Department establishes a place on Tennessee Pass, oh, probably about 15, 20 miles above Leadville on what is today Vail route of that there, a place that the soldiers assigned there used to call Camp Hell. Officially, it was Camp Hale. Irving Hale was the leader of Colorado troops during the Spanish-American War in the invasion of the Philippines, highly regarded at one time, maybe he still is, is the cadet at West Point that had the greatest possible scores, average points of anybody that ever made his way through West Point. So they were honoring General Hale there. And the men that were assigned to Camp Hale were both draftees and volunteers. The volunteers in particular were often men from affluent, comfortable families, men that had already known how to ski, enjoyed skiing from sport. A lot of them are from the East Coast that were visiting these various New England resorts. By this time as well, there's a number of Colorado boys that grow up in the mountains that also sort of just naturally take the skis, enjoy it both downhill and cross country of that. And, and then to the various draftees, they formed the 10th Mountain Division. And the conditions at the Camp Hill were vicious of this. And the drill sergeants wanted that. They wanted soldiers that would experience 40 degree below zero weather and learn how to survive in 40 degree below weather, how they could move around in isolated country a spot to move quickly out of all of that. Well, as it turns out, the 10th Mountain Division never really did any ski fighting during World War II. For the most part, it tended to be transferred to the Italian campaign, where there are some, some vicious, vicious mountain fights against the Nazis in 1943, 44, 45. But that wasn't a central sector of World War II at that time. Well, anyway, in the wake of World War II, a lot of the veterans idealized their times in Colorado. In fact, during World War II, the Denver Chamber of Commerce had a special program, invite a soldier to the Sunday dinner, especially if you have a teenage daughter or somebody in her early 20s that would like to be introduced to a brave soldier. And romances flourished on this. Marriages came out of this, and some of the returning veterans come settle in Denver. Others remember the joys they had exploring the mountains of this. Some of them had found Aspen that had these great slopes, virtually undeveloped, right outside of an old silver mining town, out of the, there, and the thought is starting to grow maybe we ought to develop Colorado as ski country USA as the ultimate ski location in the world that's going to put the Colorado of Europe, Switzerland to shame by the magnificence of its mountains and its resorts. And by December 1946, the first ski lift in Aspen lands up opening. Well, the ski lift in Aspen gets connected with yet another connection along the way, and that lands up going and being the role of Walter Pepke. Walter Pepke is the son of an affluent Prussian immigrant who grows up in Chicago in the early 20th century. Eventually, Pepke makes an immense fortune running the Container Corporation of America, but he's far more than a businessman. He's an intellectual. 
he hangs out with the president of the University of Chicago, Robert Hutchins. He hangs out with a close associate with Robert Hutchins, a leading Jewish philosopher. For Mortimer Adler itself. They're part of something that is called the Fat Men Club there that sort of gather in Chicago and they both socialize, discuss philosophy, poetry, literature, history, whatever. Meanwhile, with his wife, Elizabeth, who was nicknamed Pussy Popke out of that there uh, Walter Papke discovers Colorado in 1945, and he goes around the state, and he is impacted by the mountains. He sort of considers Perry Park off near Sedalia as a possible mountain resort, but he rediscovers Aspen in the process. And before long, he is deciding that Aspen can be the Salzburg of America. And Salzburg at this time has the reputation of being this idyllic city in Austria, the home of a famous summer music festival, of theater, of the poetry, of performances out of that, of intellectual discussions and conferences of that. And with Walter Pepke taking the lead out of this, there is this new push in the course of 1945, 46, 47, 48 to go and make Aspen into this Salzburg of America. And in the process, of course, there's the role of the Jews on this. Among the founders of Aspen about 1880 is David Hyman. The photo shows Hyman Avenue Mall, the main shopping strip, the, something of the main street almost of Aspen. David Hyman was your typical wandering Jew of the late 19th century who is in Cincinnati for a while, is given trust of investments of possible Aspen mines right when Aspen is exploded as a silver camp in the 1880s. And in fact, Aspen is this instant community next to Leadville as the greatest silver producer of Colorado. A lot of wealth is put into the community out of that. And a guy that is making sure that he and his investors get their fair share is David Hyman. He's often clashing with Jerome Wheeler, who is commemorated by the Wheeler Block, the Wheeler Opera House in Aspen. Eventually, they are partners after about 10 years of the most convoluted litigation you would never want to get involved with of that itself there. Over the years, other members of the Jewish community pop up, come and go, for example, an assistant of David Hyman is Elias Cohn. And by the late 1880s, Aspen is starting to face a crisis because its mines are flooding. Mines are basically holes in the ground, usually where all the snow is melting off and flooding them. And the response of Elias Cohn to all of this is to hire deep sea divers of that, that go down into the mines and try to drill escape holes for the water so the mines can keep flourishing. Another family that was very, very prominent up in Aspen was the Kobe's. And the Kobe's start out as a shoe and clothing manufacturing store of that itself. Uh, we yeah, sell cheap and we sell a heap was a slogan of the store out of it. Eventually, members of the Kobe family relocate to Denver, and along the way, they figure that what people need is a super delicious, utterly addic addictive snack, and they come up with Kobe's shoestring potatoes as part of that there. But for the most part, by the time the 10th Mountain Division, Walter Pepke and company are discuss uh, discovering Aspen, it's a forgotten town. Maybe 300 people are there. 
there are these houses, very substantial, that have been vacant, untouched since the financial collapse of 1893, sort of killed the Aspen silver uh, community out of that there. And what Papke is doing is he's starting to restore them. And in 1949, he sees that there, the Aspen is the home of the bicentennial celebration of the birth of Jared poet, novelist, philosopher, Goethe along the way. And meanwhile, the same thing that happened in Switzerland is happening in Aspen. Why do you simply have these various lodges going up that can be occupied only three months a year? Let's winterize them. Let's heat them. And let's bring in the ski crowd along the way. And by this time, 1947, 1948, skiing is very much on the mind of Colorado boosters and promoters. For a couple, three years, there's even a picture of a skier on Colorado license plates. In 1948, the first Winter Olympics following World War II is staged out of it. And with the launch of the Winter Olympics, there's almost this automatic response of the Colorado booster establishment that why should Switzerland, why should Norway, why should France have the Olympics? The best place in the world to have the Olympics is in Colorado. And that's sort of a slogan, but slowly in the 1950s, the ski industry is emerging. Some ski resorts are less than successful, like efforts to have a ski resort atop Pikes Peak never quite succeed. Out of that there, Vail itself is not launched until the early 1960s, but there's this lingering idea that Colorado needs to have the Winter Olympics. After making a fairly feeble bid for the 19 56 Winter Olympics, Denver sets its eye on the 1960 Olympics. And part of the hope of the 1960 Olympics is, is that generally the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, tends to go and rotate the locations of the Olympic. One year they'll be in Asia. Four years later, they'll be in Europe. Four years later, they'll be in North America or South America. And seemingly the United States turn was coming for 1960, but Squaw Valley, California supplants the Denver bid and the Squaw Valley Olympics are something of an end of an era. At that time, the Winter Olympics in particular are still something of a very small, specialized elite competition with a few international winter sports associations working with the IOC. And by the 1960s, by the time there's the Olympics in Innsbruck in 1964, Grenoble France in 1968, the Winter Olympics are starting to grow to be more than a poor cousin of the Summer Olympics. Meanwhile, in the wake of the defeat of Denver's bid for the 1960 Olympics, the booster establishment is out there fully going and pushing that what is needed is a well-prepared bid for the Winter Olympics, ideally in 1972, or even better yet, in the year of the Colorado Centennial, in the year of the United States Bicentennial of 1976. And already in the 1950s, Colorado is promoting itself as a winter sports center. Colorado Springs, especially around the Broadmoor, is emphasizing that it is ground zero of figure skating in the United States. For a while, Colorado College in Colorado Springs has an outstanding hockey team. 
the University of Denver launches an outstanding hockey program. Beginning after World War II, both the University of Colorado and the University of Denver have top ski teams. In fact, usually the winner of the competition between the DU ski team and the CU ski team is who the winner is of the yeah, NCAA ski team of that itself. Both of them win dozens of championships. And in turn, people that want to ski, athletes, you come to Colorado out of this there. And various members of international sports federations are coming into the area out of that. And the upshot of all of this is that in 1963, newly elected governor John Love, whose mission is out there to sell Colorado, is saying, yes, Denver, Colorado are going to have the Winter Olympics. And he helps form something called the COC, the Colorado Olympics Commission, out of that. Well, as the Colorado Olympics Commission is pondering how it's going to get the games out of this, it finds itself faced with some severe roadblocks. In particular, at that time, international Olympic rules specified that the Winter Olympics must be located in one host city. All the events of the Olympics must be within one hour's travel time or 50 miles of the Olympic Village. The problem is the best ski resorts in Colorado are far more than one hour's travel time or 50 minutes from the proposed Olympic Village at the University of Denver. But uh, don't worry about that there. Meanwhile, seeing that a city rather than the state must host the Olympics, they decide that the Colorado Olympic Commission is going to become the DOC in 1967, the Denver Organizing Committee for the 1976 Winter Olympics out of there. And meanwhile, instead of going and approaching the IOC and saying, well, we can't quite meet that one hour, 50 yeah, mile limit of this, come to Colorado and you will see that our facilities are so outstanding. Once you have seen them, you won't be able to resist Colorado as the home of the Winter Olympics. So instead of going and doing that, the DOC hedges its bets because everybody knows that the Broadmoor is maybe 30 minutes from Denver out of it so we can have ice skating competitions down there besides the Denver Coliseum and the DU Hockey Arena there. And the ideal place to have the crucial downhill events is Mount Snicktow. Mount Snicktow is right on the edge of the Continental Divide near about where Loveland Pass is located. Mount Snicktow has never been developed as a ski resort for two basic reasons. Number one is the drops are extremely severe, extremely challenging. And while a world-class Olympic skier can probably handle them, Virtually no amateur, somebody that is skiing for fun, would ever try risking his neck on them. But even worse, Mount Snicktow doesn't have any snow on it. It's right on the Continental Divide, and no sooner is there snow, severe winds usually blow the snow off, or where the snow congeals, it sort of is this strange, spongy substance there, which is not at all ideal for that itself. So the solution to the lack of snow on Mount Snicktow, according to the DOC, was very, very simple. They hire a darkroom artist, they give him a picture of Mount Snicktow, and they have the darkroom artist paint lush snow on the slopes of Mount Snicktow. 
Meanwhile, the cross country events, the ski jumping, the bobsleds, the luge was going to be at Indian Hills. And Indian Hills was sort of this secluded mountain village summer resort that's increasingly becoming a full time residential area, not that far from evergreen up this and basically the doc simply comes in and says here's what we're going to do there's nothing to worry about we are only going to cut an eight foot swath through your backyards for the cross country events but it's not going to interfere with your property and it'll disappear afterwards of that itself and well where's everybody going to park well we're close to Evergreen Lake and Evergreen Lake freezes over in the winter. So we're going to clear the snow off of Evergreen Lake and uh, go and basically have that as our parking lot with shuttle buses to the locations of the various events. And for some reason, the people up in Evergreen Indian Hills get extremely nervous with all of that. But meanwhile, the DOC has established excellent ties with leading politicians, with the American sports establishment, and they get the nod from the United States Olympic Committee about 1968 to bid as the American candidate for the 1976 Winter Olympics, almost a shoe in given American power and the impending bicentennial of that. And meanwhile, the DOC is sort of this closed club. It's the bankers, the country club crowd, the leading CEOs itself that has terrible public outreach of this. And when their people are starting to squawk up in Indian Hills Evergreen, they're saying, oh, don't be yeah, a complainer. Everything is going to go and turn out right along the way out of this, but they're still grumbling is constantly growing. And this is particularly the situation in the early spring of 1970, 1971. 1970 is the time of divisions over the Vietnam War. It is the time of the United States invasion of Cambodia. It is the time of Kent State slaughtering, protesting anti-war protesters. And right when there's massive upheavals associated with that, including at Denver, especially at the University of Denver, there's a student encampment, Woodstock West, the mayor is absent. The governor is absent. All of Colorado bigwigs are in Amsterdam at this time where the IOC is set to award the 1976 Winter Olympics out of it. By this time, the State Department has gone and lobbied countries in Latin America that if you want further aid, you better vote for Denver for the Winter Olympics. And on the fourth ballot, Denver wins the Winter Olympics. And this is considered salvation, that Denver now is finally in the sunshine. But do we want to be in the sunshine? How often are winters like the current winter where there really isn't that much snow, especially up near evergreen Indian hills out of that itself. And the people up there are increasingly complaining. They're saying there's nothing to worry about. If there's not enough natural snow, we'll simply make snow. And all the farmers are saying, no, 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 you're not going to steal our water for that. And the true purists in the world of cross country skiing, bobsleds, others say, no, it has to be natural snow. It's not the same thing as artificial snow on that. And soon the fairly affluent, well-educated work within the system, people that are living up 
in Evergreen and Indian Hills decide they better do something and they land up forming a group called POEM, P-O-M-E, Protect Our Mountain Environment. And they're starting to ask enough questions where the DOC is, well, we'll think about this itself on their itself. But for the most part, the DOC is saying, we have power, here's what's going to go on. And how much are the Olympics going to cost? 5 million, 10 million, 25 million, 50 million, 100 million. The Grenoble Olympics in 1968 are 250 million. The 1972 Sapporo Japan Winter Olympics are even higher in cost out of it. And so there's some questions emerging there. And for the most part, the DOC won't listen. Well, to try to get somebody to listen about that, locals, especially veterans of the anti-war movement, work within the system, goody-goody liberals of this, land up forming in early 1972, Citizens for Colorado's Future, CCF. And they write the IOC trying to explain how chaotic the Denver Olympic bid is. And the IOC is this ultra conservative, almost aristocratic body that does not listen to plebeians of this. And the response that the Colorado uh, for Citizens Future lands up getting from the IOC is if you have any problems with Denver's bid for the 1976 Winter Olympics, you should write the Denver Organizing Committee. Here is its address. So the members of CCF decide what is needed is direct action. And this is the case when the International Olympic Committee is gathering during the Sapporo Winter Olympics. And since the IOC won't listen to them, they go and decide to invade the exclusive, sacred meeting room of the IOC Executive Committee. Help! We've been invaded! Terrorists! Get these American peasants out of here! There's a mass police response where they drag the representatives of Citizens for Colorado's Future out of the chambers of the IOC. But the invasion had an impact. And in particular, the crusty head of the IOC Avery Brundage starts asking questions. Is this true about Mount Snicktow when you simply painted snow on it? And uh, what is this about uh, your lies about Evergreen and the, the travel times of this? And when the DOC can't answer the questions, the IOC Executive Committee uh, goes and cancels the 1976 Winter Olympics. No sooner has it canceled the 1976 Winter Olympics than there is mass outrage led by the State Department, led by President Richard Nixon. Virtually the entire American sports establishment is saying, we are going to have the Winter Olympics in Denver in 1976. The pressure is so great that the IOC is forced to reverse its decision, and on the closing day of the 1972 Sapporo Winter Olympics, the sign is declaring we will meet four years from now in Denver. Well, now the problem is, is how are we actually going to go and have the Olympics? And the cross-country down uh, skiing just isn't going to work in Indian Hills, Evergreen, so they decide let's move it to Steamboat Springs. The problem is 50 mile, one hour travel time to get to Steamboat Springs. There's nothing to worry about. We are going to invent a short takeoff and landing jet helicopter that will buzz athletes and officials from the Olympic Village at DU to Steamboat Springs within an hour out of that there. And well, maybe the Broadmoor isn't going to work, but the 
bicentennial funds are going to build a new sports arena for Denver for the hockey ISA competitions out of that itself. And well, Mount Snicktow isn't going to work. We are going to move the events up to Vail and the emerging just plan Beaver Creek development out of that. Well, how are we going to pay for all of this? We're going to get television revenue. And when the television networks review how undeveloped communications are in the high Colorado Rockies, they don't bid that much because they know they're going to have to invest so much in the infrastructure that uh, uh, they just can't pay that much for the Olympics there. Well, we'll get the revenue through ticket sales of this. Well, who really wants to go up atop an icy cold mountain and stand there for hours on end and just see a skier buzz by every five minutes or so when they can watch the games on television instead? We are going to put in a blackout rule that the only way people in Colorado can see the Olympics is by buying tickets to them. And you peasants that won't buy tickets, tough luck, you aren't going to get to see the Olympics out of that. Well, where's everybody going to stay that go up to the mountains to see the events? Vail doesn't have that many hotel rooms. It's still an emerging community. Well, what we're going to do is we are going to take old Pullman sleeping cars out of mothballs. And we are going to go and have a ski train that is going to haul 15, 20 coaches of Pullman cars up to Vail for the duration of the Winter Olympics. And that's where people are going to stay is in these new sidings we're going to build outside of Vail for all the old Pullman sleeping cars out of it. They are of that. And every time the DOC is going and mentioning something like this, it comes up with an even screwier overtone. And all the while, instead of addressing critics, it has a smear machine. Either you are a loyal, patriotic American, and you support the Olympics, or you are some creepy, hippie commie out of that there that shouldn't be listened to under any effect of this. And seeing that there is no hope of going and getting any hearing from the DOC, which is supported by the state legislature, by the governor, by city council, by Denver Mayor Bill, Bill McNichols, who's the guy on one ski, one ice skate out of that next to Governor Love going and beating the drum in the middle out of that there, the CCF decides that what is needed is a referendum, basically a referendum stating that not one penny of state money is to go and to pay for the Winter Olympics. Well, so they put on something called Proposition 8 on the ballot for 1972. But if you are against the Olympics, you have to see that Proposition 8 passes. So they adopt sort of this ironical tone of vote yes for no Olympics. And soon there is the, just this amazing grassroots mobilization behind Proposition 8. And the original response of the DOC is that is the most ridiculous proposal we have ever heard of here of this. It'll never make the ballot. It makes the ballot. So it's on the ballot. It's going to be overwhelmingly defeated when the polls are showing that Proposition 8 will most likely go and pass this. The DOC's response is, it doesn't matter. We will have so much private money available. We won't need any state money out of it there. But anyway, by the fall of 1972, Colorado is totally 
polarized over the Olympics out of it. The DOC sort of collapses at this time, replaced by the Denver Olympic Organizing Commission out of it, the DOOC. And come election day in November 1972, Proposition 8 passes by 60% to 40%. Well, no sooner have the election results come in than the supporters of the Olympics say, those don't matter. We are going to have the Olympics anyway. And backers of the Olympics land up going and getting uh, a court injunction saying that the DOOC cannot inform the International Olympic Committee about what's going on. So when I got into the archives of the Olympics, I find this hilarious letter on the morning after the Olympics. And it's basically, dear IOC, crucial events have occurred in Denver and Colorado concerning our ability to host the 1976 Winter Olympics. However, because of a court order, we can't tell you what's going on. The ridiculousness of this position is so obvious. The injunction is quashed out of that there, and the Olympics are dead. And this is just the first beginning. And I say I have something like about three minutes left in terms of all of this, because you have the leader of the anti-Olympic forces, Dick Lamb, becomes governor. Ever since then, there has been proposal after proposal after proposal that Denver should have the 2026 Olympics. It should have the 2030 Olympics, the 2042 Olympics. It doesn't matter. And voters keep passing anti-Olympic actions of this. By the way, a lot of what I've been talking about is in my book on this, which is called Denver in Our Time, that has a lengthy chapter about what happens with the 1972 Olympics and its outreach there. Incidentally, I also have out a brand new edition of my book, called The Ghosts of Denver, Capitol Hill, that talks a lot about old Jewish Capitol Hill, as well as the many ghosts that sort of maybe they are what we're going and occupying the brains of the DOC, explaining the Olympics that never were.